But I want us to turn back now to John chapter 4. and We've seen some great things in this book. Some of the things we've seen is Jesus turning water into wine, revealing something of His glory there in John chapter 2. He cleansed the temple in John chapter 2 as well. And we also see in the Gospel of John how Jesus knows the hearts of all men. You know, sometimes you're going through life, maybe you're witnessing to someone, and you're looking at him, he's looking at you, he's telling you one thing, and you have a sneaky suspicion what's coming out of his mouth may not be what's in his heart, but you, you don't know for sure. Well, Jesus never had that problem, did he? Jesus knows all men perfectly. And then, of course, in John 3, we saw Nicodemus, a man that many people would love to have as pastor. And yet Jesus said, you're not even saved. You need to be born again. So we see some of these great truths in the Gospel of John. And last time that we were in the Gospel of John, we're in chapter 4. Jesus has spoken to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And we looked at last time about true worship, if you remember that. That we must worship God in spirit and in truth. And we saw a few things then. One thing that we saw was that God's worship is not contained in one location anymore. You know, they had the temple back then. But we don't have the temple today. We are the temple. So everywhere we go, we're to worship God. Everything we do should be worshiped. We are the temple of God. The Spirit of God lives within us. We are the temple of God. But now we pick back up in John 4, and the woman at the well has already heard from Jesus. She has left. She has gone back to her own people. She has witnessed to them. And one thing that we'd seen is so beautiful is that what did she come to get? She came to get water. And when she leaves Jesus, she leaves her water pot there with Jesus, which shows that she did get water, but she got spiritual water, living water that Jesus spoke to her about. And aren't you glad today, you that are Christians, that you got living water one day? That you got the Spirit of God coming and living within you, moving inside, leading, convicting, disciplining us when we sin. He lives within us. And we thank God for that. She has gone, and now Jesus' disciples have come back. We read the passage earlier. And I want you to listen to verse 35. Do you not say, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you. This is Jesus speaking. Look, I tell you. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now obviously, He's not speaking of farming here. He is speaking of lifting up our eyes and look out. You disciples, he's speaking to the disciples here, you say in four months, or it takes four months, you sow and then you reap. But what he says to them is this, lift up your eyes and look all around you. And look at all these people who need the Lord. All these people are here around you. Lift up your eyes and see. They need to become Christians. So he is not speaking to us about bringing in people who are already saved. Though if you know people who are Christians and they either go to a bad church, and you say that's judgmental. It might be, but if it's true, it's true. Or if you know people who maybe are good Christians, and they are right now looking for... Well, yes, we obviously we want them to come in. But what Jesus is looking at it here is this. The fields are white for harvest. People are out here around us, and they need the Lord. They need the Lord, is what He's looking at. And if you remember what I've said before, when you read the Gospel of John, remember John 20, verse 31. Because that tells us what this Gospel is primarily about. And in John chapter 20, verse 31, the Bible speaks about that John has written these things so we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, and by believing have life in His name. That's the reason John wrote this Gospel. And the way that this that ties in with what we're looking at today, one of the reasons is this. One of the ways is that for this message to get out so people can be saved, the people who already know God have to get this message out. 
So us today, we have met together to worship God. We have met together to hear from God's Word. God is saying to us today as Christian people that we have the duty and the responsibility and the privilege of taking God's Word and giving it to other people who need it. That's our duty and responsibility and privilege today to be reminded of. God, one day that we were beggars, we were hungry, we have no bread, and God gave us bread, His Son, the Lord Jesus, and now He tells us who have bread and enjoy the bread to go find other beggars who need it and to spread His Word out to other people so other people can be saved. Aren't you glad that whether somebody came to your door one day or or whether you heard an evangelist preaching or a pastor preaching, that one day the message came to you? Are you glad about that? I hope we are. Praise the Lord for that. God's message came to us. God gave us life from the death. From death. Well, I want us to see today, as we look back here in verse 35, one of the big things I want us to see is this. We need to be reminded of this. And listen, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher. I've preached now for almost 15 years, etc. It doesn't change. I need reminded of this. If I'm not careful, I may, I may just simply study the Bible. And if I'm not careful, if my heart goes away from God, I can read the Bible every day for academic purposes. Raise your hand if you think the Bible is only for academics. No. The Bible is for life. The Bible is for living. And all of us, including myself, need to be reminded of the truth here that Jesus gives to us. Well, look with me in verse 35 again. He says, do, not, do you not say there are yet four months? Now, some people would see that and they, they may think that Jesus is literally saying they just sowed and now four months later there's harvest. Or he may just be saying a parable to them. How it normally is in that day and what they sow and what they reap. Either way, we see, he says, you know, you're thinking about this, but there's something else that you need to think about. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white. For harvest. And what myself and you, all of us here, need to do is to be reminded to lift up our eyes and look around us, look at our community, and see there's people all around us who need the Lord. They're all around us. I've I've lived in Kentucky, I've lived in Tennessee, I've lived in Georgia now, and I can tell you the same thing as many of you maybe who have traveled or have lived other places and now have come back. Every place you go to, people are there who need God. Am I right? Everywhere. I'm reminded there was a book written back in the 1800s called Acres of Diamonds. And the man in that book gave a parable or a story from what he heard from a guide once in the Middle East and I'm going to probably use it a little bit different than he did, but he told a story about a man who was very content in life. He thought he was very wealthy. And he went to bed happy, got up happy. And basically how the story goes is this. He heard a Buddhist priest talking to him about diamonds. How valuable diamonds are. And this man, though before in his life he was content and happy, now he saw himself as poor. I don't have any diamonds. So what this man does, he he goes about, he travels, he goes to different places, he's searching for these diamonds. He just wants to find the diamonds. Finally, I don't know how long it takes, he's he's depressed, his health is broken, he spent all his money, he sold his land, he can find no diamonds, and he kills himself. At some point in the story, somebody went and bought his land that he sold, the man that killed himself looking for diamonds. The the land that he sold, someone bought it. You know what happens in that story or parable? The man finds diamonds on his property from the man who left his property. There's diamonds. and, And it's kind of a motivational book, I think. And one of the points, I think, is this. There's diamonds all around us. Don't go looking over the world. Look where we're at. And I'm saying to us today, there's diamonds everywhere around us. 
They just need somebody to look for them. They just need someone to go to them and reach out to them and help them. But who are these people? There's a bunch of people like this. They all look different on the surface. They're all the same. Uh, If you remember, Nicodemus was an extremely religious man. He was a man who, who, like I said, any church would love to have him as pastor. You have him in John 3. You turn to John 4. What do you see? You see a woman who everybody thought was an outcast probably. Nobody wanted to be around her. Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman were very, very different on the surface. When you looked at their heart, their need was exactly the same. They needed to be saved. So when you think about people today who need the Lord, you're thinking about hurting people, aren't you? How many of you know somebody's hurting? Emotionally, physically, people who are hurting on the inside, people who have been hurt very much by family members, people who have been hurt maybe by churches, people who have been hurt by a former spouse maybe. There's people all around us who are hurting that need the Lord. There's people all around us who very unfortunately, and this is an epidemic really, especially It's everywhere, but especially where I come from in East Kentucky and Ohio and also Tennessee, West Virginia, that area, drugs, substance abuse is an epidemic. And I know it's it's the same here. There's people like that who the world has given up on, but let me tell you, the church better not give up on them because God's not given up on them. There's people who through drugs or alcohol may have wrecked their life, but God is in the business of restoring life and giving life. Again, to people who are dead. And we as the church need to see these people, not as people who are weird and out there, but people who need reached. There's di- they're diamonds. And God just needs to take them and work on them for a little bit. We look at people who are poor. We look at people who are rich, but very empty on the inside. You know, you see this pretty often. You, you, you find somebody being honest, they're wealthy, they're famous, and you, they have everything they want, and yet sometimes they will even profess, I'm not happy though. doesn't matter how little or how more that someone may have than us. Everyone needs the Lord. You look at the powerful, the men and women who the world views as powerful. I remember one man very fondly. Powerful man in the community. In sports, in especially... A powerful man who needed God. He, uh, I, I think I told this maybe on a Wednesday night or something. I can't remember exactly. But he, this, this man was a powerful baseball coach. And he had won uh, at least one, if not two, state championships. He was a championship golfer. I think he had won six championships at the local club there back home where I'm from. He, he was a basketball coach. He was a man of power. and Everybody knew him. And listen, I wish he would have got saved earlier. You should have heard him speak, his voice. He could have been over there half a mile away and say something. You could almost hear him. His voice was so powerful. He was a mighty man. My dad was was a scare. I was on the golf course trying to witness this man, and my dad was kind of scared for me. He's Clint. What this man's going to kill you? Basically, it was his idea. This because this man he was. Well, you get the picture. And yet God saved this man. Oh, everybody needs the Lord. Everybody does. You've got the forgotten people. You've got the the rough people. How many of you know some rough people? Listen, I want to know, if you all know the quote-unquote biggest sinner around, I want to know that person and meet them so I can witness to them. I want to find the biggest sinner around because I think oftentimes when quote-unquote the biggest sinner around gets saved, he loves God more than very, very most of the people. The reason for this is because Jesus said, you remember what Jesus said, He that is forgiven little loves little. He's talking to the Pharisee about the woman who came to him. But then he says, He that is forgiven much loves much. So we should want to find the biggest sinner, so to speak, around because when he gets saved or she gets saved, they're going to love God so much, they're going to tell the world about God. So you find them. 
And you witness to them and you tell me, I want to reach out to these people. You've got people today who are who have been in sexual sin and because of their sexual sin, they're ashamed of their past. They're ashamed of some of the things they've looked at and done and participated in and, and stolen even from people. Maybe. They're ashamed of that. They need God. They need saved just like we needed saved one. There's people out there who are clean cut, conservative. They are just a picture of everything of the American dream and yet they're just like Nicodemus. They do not have the Spirit of God living within them. They do not love the Word of God. They do not love prayer. They don't love the things of God. They haven't been saved yet. And these clean cut conservative people need saving. They're all around us. And we as Christians have the Gospel message to give it to them. There's people around us who outwardly look different than us. You remember, what's Jesus? Who's He dealing with here? He's dealing with the Samaritans. The Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. There's people around us of different ethnicities, different cultures. God doesn't care anything about that. They need to be reached. And it's us who have the Gospel to bring that Gospel to them so they can be reached for the Lord. There's people around us who confess to know God, but in their life they have no fruit whatsoever. There's no spiritual reality. There's people around us who are outcasts. There's people around us who are single mothers. How many single mothers do we know who need the Lord and need help in their life as well? Who would love for somebody to reach out to them and help them right now in in the difficulty they're in. Someone may say, well, it's their fault they're in there. Hey friend, it's our fault that we were lost sinners too. And God saved us. There's people out there who are fathers whose wife has left them and took the kids away and they are broken hearted. They need us. They need Christ in their life. It's our neighbors, our old friends, our co-workers, strangers, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, grandfathers and grandmothers, best friends. There's people all around us who need the Lord. Let me say this. You all have a... You all have such a privilege. Uh, I say this jokingly, but it makes me jealous in one sense. The reason it makes me jealous is you, you've got so many people you can reach to and know and witness to that I don't. Many of you have grown up here. You have f- big families. You, you've had co-workers for years. You have you've have all of this and you can reach out to them. And that's wonderful. What a privilege that you all have to be able to do that. And with great privilege comes great responsibility, right? There is great responsibility with knowing so many people around us because God expects Christians who have the Gospel to be able to share with the people around us. There's great privilege here. Well, we go through this big list. Let me read a passage to you. Think back to who we were before we were saved, friends. The Bible says, do you not know or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And listen to what he says now. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Some of those sins characterized us before we were saved, friends. And it's to those very people in our communities that God has sent us out to go and to witness to and to see that they are saved for the Lord. See that they're brought to Him and converted. Well, how can we reach these people? Uh, if you're interested more in that, I think there's eight or nine sermons on the internet about evangelism that were preached last year on Sunday nights. But let's look at this a little bit this morning. How can we reach these people? You've got people all around you. They're everywhere. How can we as God's people reach these people? Well, the first thing I would say to us is this. The first thing we have to do is make sure that we've been reached. That's the first thing we have to do. 
the first thing we have to do is look at ourselves and say, has God reached me? Yes, I may profess to know God. Yes, I may be in the church. But has God reached me? Has the Son of God saved me? Have I been born again yet? We start there. But secondly then, this is something that we see in this passage. We have to be with people who are lost. You and I have to be with people who need Christ to be able to reach people. Where is Jesus at? Jesus is at the well with the woman. It's a little socially awkward for Him as a Jew. It's more than just a little. He's a Jew. She's a Samaritan. He's a man. She's a woman. She has a sexual history. He's a Jewish rabbi. So it's a little odd in one sense for Him to be there, and yet He's there with her. You see in verse 40 in chapter 4, that the Samaritans, again, the Jews and the Samaritans had no dealings with each other. And yet, when the Samaritans asked Jesus to come and stay with them, He went for two days and stayed with them. So the first thing that we have to do to reach people is to actually be with people who are lost. Now this may mean for some of us that we have to purposely put ourselves in a position to be around people who don't know the Lord. Maybe in your own situation, in your circumstances, you're simply not around a lot of people that often, especially lost people. But what the Bible would lead us to believe then is this, we have to purposely go out of our way and go to witness to people. Now this may look different in different circumstances. This may mean that we try to eat and shop at the same places more regularly. Because if you eat and shop at the same places or stop in at the same places more regularly, you're going to build relationships with your waiter or waitress. You're going to maybe meet the owner of that shop and he's going to appreciate your business. You know, I I love to eat at different places. Nothing wrong with that. But when we think about the gospel and the need to reach other people, we need to think about maybe I need to focus in on less places to eat and less shops So I get to know those people and are able to witness those people. I want to be around lost men and women. We can't witness unless we're around people who need to be witnessed to. By the way, let me say this. When you go out to eat, you should be the nicest person to your waiter. Oh my goodness, what I've seen in my life. I've seen Christian people go out and eat and I just wanted to put my head under the table and open the floor and crawl out and go out in my vehicle and never go back because of how disgusting they acted toward their waiter and waitress. Somebody says that, well, that's my right. I'm paying. This is my right. You know what the Apostle Paul says? He says, I give up my rights so I may win others for the gospel. It may be our right because we're paying for it, my friends. On the day of judgment, God's not going to say, I'm glad you took your right out there. What I'm saying is this, when we go out, we should be the nicest, most kind, forgiving, generous people around for the gospel's sake, to reach out to them, to help them, because they want to see Christ in us. So it may mean that we go out of our way, we eat and shop at the same places for the gospel. It may mean that you invite, obviously it's good to invite Christian people over to your house and eat. That's a wonderful thing. But it may mean also you invite lost people to your house to eat with you. I have found this out. There's a lot of ministry happens in the home and around the table. That is one of the reasons we started the home Bible study is because I know from the past experiences, a lot of ministry happens at the home. In the first century actually, they met their church meetings were at homes. So you see this in the Bible. You see this in practice. And it may be that we, as God's people, we need, you have some old classmates, you have some neighbors, you know they're not Christians, or at least they're not following the Lord from the best you can tell right now. Invite them over for dinner. Speak about the old days. Speak about things. Speak, But also speak about the Gospel. Speak to them about their soul. Speak to them about how they need to be saved. It may be that you call up old friends, have a conversation on the phone. It may mean that you reach out to your neighbors around your homes. Somebody says, but Brother Clint, that's a lot of work to do. 
I suppose it could be. But look in verse 34. They came to Jesus. The disciples has gone off to get food. They come back. They said, are you hungry? Verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. That's my food, Jesus said. My food is to do God's will. And what is God's will? God's will is for us here today, every one of you who are Christians, to reach out to other non-Christians and bring them in. It's like one preacher, similar to one preacher said, sinners say they would be in paradise if only everything could go the way that they wanted it to go. Have you ever been around somebody like that? They'd be the happiest person in the world if only everything went their way. Jesus Christ says here, though, my will is to do God's will. And when you think about our lives, Christians, you think about who we are, we think about the fact that happiness is only found not in our wills, but God's will. If we live our lives for what we want in life, and listen, there's nothing wrong about having fun in life. The Bible says God has given us all things richly to enjoy. There's nothing wrong about being responsible and having fun like that. There's nothing wrong with that. And yet, if my whole life is given to just what I want to do, I'm going to be miserable in the end. And the happiness I have in this life is going to have to be the happiness that you have to hold up. You know, you got to put... I was over at Brother Johnny's yesterday in this beautiful building. It's not held up. You know, they have those the two-by-fours out. They're holding it together for everything's. You're going to have to hold things up for your whole life because true happiness comes by doing God's will and what God wants us to do. One of the greatest callings that a pastor has is not primarily to evangelize. Now, I evangelize. I love it. I want to do more of it. Praise God for that. Hope God helps me. Hope you pray for me that I can be a witness. But biblically speaking, one of the primary functions of a pastor is to help other people be built up to serve God in the ministry. I've got it in my notes, but I want us to turn there. Turn to Ephesians 4 with me, because I want us to see this together. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Start reading with me in verse 12. Verse 11 talks about God has gifted the church, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Talks about that. And then we turn now, though, to verse 13. Verse 12, rather. To equip the saints. Now, why has God given these gifts to the church? Why has God gifted people in this way? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ. One of the primary reasons we meet on Sunday mornings is so all of us can be built up for the ministry. There was a, there's a church, some of you may know the name John MacArthur, famous pastor in California. He's been there over 50 years. Well, there's an article written about his church some years ago. He had about 900 members at the time at his local church in California. And the article that came out, the title of it was The Church with 900 Ministers. 900 ministers. They didn't have 900 pastors. But the point that that man that wrote the article was this, every member of that church had a ministry to the Lord. And that's what God wants with every church. All of us have different giftings. All of us have different circumstances. Our service is going to look different than other, just like my foot looks different than my hand, but we're all part of the same body. My foot and hand, though, has a function to do in my body. The same thing here. All of us may look different. We have different giftings. All of us here are called to minister. There's no such thing as being a spectator in God's church. Do you believe that? There's no such thing about spectating Christianity. The Bible says here that one of the main functions of a pastor is to equip the saints for ministry, to build them up, 
to help them in evangelism, to help them in loving people, to help them in good works. All this is true. The Bible even says in Titus, we have to remind and teach people to do good works. I need taught that as well at times. I need reminded as well. All of us though are ministers of Christ in one sense. And all of us one day will have to give an account for the people around us in our lives who are lost and we are around them, we are near them, and we can reach out to them and tell people the Gospel. All of us have that responsibility in life. You, you may not be able to obviously do what I can. I am blessed. The church here is blessed. I'm a full-time pastor. I thank God for that. So yes, I have different opportunities. And yet, you all have different opportunities than I have. I can't go to work with you. I, I, I could, but I normally don't go to your family functions. And that's okay. What I'm saying is you all individually have different opportunities that I don't have. I, can't, I don't go to work with you. I don't go to family functions with you, etc., etc. But you do. And we all carry the Gospel with us. We all carry the cross with us to give to other people. I can't go to school with you. But you can go there. You know the people there. Some of you live away a little bit at least away from this area. Well, I can't live over there. I live here. But you do. You live up there. You live down there. You can reach those people. The fields are white for harvest. Lift up our eyes and see there's people all around us who just need somebody to go seeking for them. Because I can tell you this, they're not going to seek God unless someone seeks them first. None of us here sought God until God sought us through His Spirit and through His servants. None of us here sought God on our own. That's like a criminal seeking out the police to turn himself in. Doesn't happen very often. The same thing with, with sinners out here in the world. They're not seeking after God very often. Somebody has to go and seek after them and try to bring them in and try to win them for the Lord. Now I know I've talked about the duty and responsibility and privilege that we have as Christians to, to witness to people. All that is true. All that is good. You may be here and you say, that's just not my gifting though. I'm not gifted to speak like that. Well, this, what I'm talking about, is not an issue of giftedness. It's like it's been said, it's an issue of obedience. Each and every one of us, it doesn't matter, you may be more, this may surprise you, I'm naturally a shy person. When I was called to preach, my pastor in Kentucky said something like he, he didn't know I could talk. I am naturally a shy person. In one sense, I still don't like speaking in front of people. Now, if I'm preaching or teaching, that's different now. But just to be in an audience and have somebody call on me, listen, if you have that fear, <laughs> I know what you're going through. When I go to some kind of large gathering, I do not want people calling on me to do anything, unless it's speak about the Bible or so. I do not want to be pointed out. I do not want to be picked on. If you go, if you ever are afraid to go to a place because you know they're having a funny skit and you're afraid they're going to pick you to go up front to do something funny, that's me. I don't want that. I would almost rather give $50 and get out of there instead of going up forward and doing something. That's not me. And you may feel, you say, that's just not, I'm just not an evangelist. All of us here have been given this opportunity to speak for God. To witness for Him. Every one of us who are Christians have been given this responsibility to go out and to speak to other people. Now, we have to be around lost people. That's true. But here's the next truth. We have to speak to people, right? It's not enough just to simply be around them. You know, you may have... Uh, for years before you were saved, you may have been around co-workers who were Christians. They were around you all the time and they never spoke to you about Christ. It's not enough just to be around people. That's a start. But we have now to speak to them. Open our mouths up and speak to them. Be friendly. Be natural. We don't have to be weird about it. But we have to do this. This is not the preacher saying this. This is God saying this to us this morning. God wants us to go out. The fields are white for harvest. Go and win 
the lost. Go and reach out to them. But this is one of the big things too. And we see this in this passage in John 4. Not only do we have to be around lost people, and not only do we have to speak to lost people, we have to speak God's truth to lost people. We can talk about the weather all day long, but the weather's not going to get it done. That may be a starting point. But we as God's people not only have to be around people to speak to people, but we have to actually speak God's truth to people. We see this in this passage. Jesus comes to her. They're in a, they're, he starts the conversation, yes, but He's the one that brings up spiritual things. He begins to speak about living waters. Don't, don't wait many times for a lost person to bring up spiritual things. It's most likely going to be the Christian. Now we listen, we wait, there may be a door opening. All that is true. But we are the ones who have to bring the topic up very often. We have to speak God's truth. And what is that truth? When you think about the Gospel of Christ, you're thinking about a message that people don't want. I understand. Because listen, I like to speak to people, but that doesn't mean I don't have any fear in my heart when I do. I want to speak to people about their soul, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a weight and I don't have a lot of things going on inside of me saying, no, no, don't do it. It's not the right time. No, no. They may get upset. They may get mad. They may not appreciate that. You may lose a friend. The fact of the matter is this, though. We are called to speak. And what Jesus does here is speak about this lady's sin. The main thing that Jesus does is show this lady, yes, He knows everything. He's a prophet. Yes, yes, and more than a prophet. But one thing Jesus does is He brings up her sin. Now, that's uncomfortable, right? She says, Jesus says, bring your husband. And the lady says to Jesus, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You've had five husbands and the man you're with now is not your husband. That's uncomfortable. And yet if we want to see people saved, though we may not be that bold every time, obviously we don't have the knowledge that Christ has, but if we're going to see people saved, we are going to have to speak to them about their soul and about their sin. The Ten Commandments, that's one thing we teach our children at home, is to learn the Ten Commandments. That's one thing that we need to know. For one reason, yes, it helps us live. But another thing is this, when we speak to lost people, we can very gently and lovingly say to them, well, have you kept the Third Commandment? Have you ever used God's name in vain? Have you kept the seventh commandment? You shall not commit adultery. And Jesus said that if a man lusts with his mind or heart at a woman, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. Or we may say, well, have you kept the sixth commandment? Have you murdered anybody? And they say, well, no, I haven't killed anyone. But then we can say, but the Bible says if we hate our brothers, we are a murderer before God. It's the commandments of God that bring out our sin. They show us our wickedness. And it's one thing that we need to use when we speak to people about their soul is the fact that you are not a good person. You have disobeyed God's law and God will hold you accountable to that. You need a Savior. Christ has died to take away your sins and you need to go to Him and by faith believe in Him and repent and follow Him all the days of your life. The gospel message has to get out to our friends and our family. I want you to look in verse 37 and 38. You know, some of us, I know that I'm like this, I become discouraged sometimes. Maybe I'm witnessing the people and I'm not seeing anything happen. I've been praying maybe for somebody, I've witnessed to them a few times, and nothing is happening there. Well, look at what verse 37 and 38 says. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. You know, every time we sow, we're not going to reap at the same time. And every time we see somebody saved and come to Christ, it doesn't mean we've sowed in their life. We all work together. You may have a family member. 
And they're on the verge, and God's the only one that knows this. They're on a verge of becoming a Christian. But they're on a verge of becoming a Christian because of his grandmother, who's dead and with the Lord now, been praying for, prayed for him for years, and she's gone on. They may be on the verge of becoming a Christian because their pastor, who's dead now, 20, 30 years ago, preached to them and tried to help them and witness to them. And you come along and you witness to them and they get saved that day. Well, most likely, you're standing on the shoulders of people who came before you. Sometimes it's a day for sowing and not for reaping. Sometimes it's a day of reaping and we're not sowing. Sometimes it's just a day of plowing. We're not doing anything. We're just trying to break up the soil. We're trying to break up hardened hearts. What I'm getting at is this. You can't, and I need to preach myself on this, you can't necessarily get discouraged because you're witnessing the people and they've not got saved yet. It's, you don't know God's timing. You don't know God's work. It may be God's will for you to sow and water in their life and a few years later someone else is going to come along and reap the harvest. We're, they're in God's hands as we're in God's hands. Our duty, and this should help us, our duty in life as, as people who share and speak the gospel to people is not to save people. You can't save anybody. You say, you're right, preacher. I'm not a preacher like you. Friends, I can't save anybody either. I've never saved a soul. Our duty and responsibility and privilege is not to save people. It's to tell people the Gospel. I can't make someone saved. I'm going out. i got a little garden this year. It's my responsibility to put the seed and the plants down there, but I can't make them bear fruit. I can do things that can help, but I can't make them bear fruit. And it's our responsibility to tell people about God. It's our responsibility to pray. It's our responsibility to speak to people. I can't save them though. God does that. God does that. And what you see through history, and it's so beautiful when you see the whole Bible's message. What happens in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve sins, and what happens? God comes down. God comes down in the garden as the evangelist. Years and years later, mankind is lost, they're on earth, and what happens? Jesus Christ comes down to seek and to save that which was lost. And now what do we see? Christ has come, He has died, He's gone back to heaven, and what do we see now? The Spirit of God has come and lives within us, and God is still appealing to men and women through us today. God in the garden, Jesus on earth, and now the Spirit in us, and we are the ones who are called to go and to witness and to win the lost for Christ with His help. Just think, just think of how many families are here today. I'm not talking about big families, but specific individual families that are here. Just think about next Sunday if each family had one person come with them to church service. Now again, church service Inviting people to church is not necessarily evangelism. We're talking about evangelism. But it may be through your witnessing to them, or it may be through you simply invite them to church, they come and they hear the gospel from the pulpit. Just think of the people you know around you. Just think of your family and friends and co-workers. Just think of the influence you have that I don't have. And just think of each family here this morning brought one visitor with them next Sunday. And just think sometime in the future, some of those visitors, they're saved, or they join the church and they're here, and they have a burden now to go out and bring one person. You see, that's how the church grows. Like the church in California, the church that had 900 ministers. The church grows when all the parts of the body work together as one under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we serve God. And we can see, by God's grace, great things happen. So here's your homework. Bring somebody with you. Most importantly, witness to somebody this week. That's the most important thing. But see if you can bring somebody with you next Sunday to hear the Gospel. And pray this week for a soul to be saved. And for God to bless our church here as we seek to serve Him together. This is our great joy and responsibility. Let me tell you a story real quick at the end here. I was living in Nashville at the time. 
Uh, I was in Tennessee, but I lived in Tennessee, and then I went to Kentucky, then I went back to Tennessee. But anyway, I was in Nashville at the time. And I was at a, I was at a uh, grocery store. And I saw a man who was there at the grocery store. And I can't explain this. I don't know if it's ever happened to me, not like this. I had one of my gospel tracts with me. And I went up to this person in the grocery store, in the aisle. And I started talking to him. And I gave him a gospel tract. And I left. And maybe for 24 hours later, maybe less, maybe more, I could not describe the joy I had. Now listen, I had not done anything special in one sense. I had no confirmation that God was going to save that person or what. But well, for whatever reason, at that time, I'll just say this to illustrate, God supernaturally gave me such joy that exceeds anything I've experienced in life. All my greatest joys. I've been so blessed, as many of you have, but all my greatest joys, the top of the top of the top, have been with God. And what I'm saying is this. One thing I'm trying to say is this. When we evangelize God, not that He does that every time. Sometimes we may feel like we did a, a terrible job and our, ha- our head is hanging low. Maybe it shouldn't be. But when we obey God and do what He says, God sometimes will pour out a blessing upon us that we cannot contain. Our cup will overflow. We're walking on the mountains. Forget the mountains. We're on the clouds now. God has come down afresh in our soul. And the joy I felt when I got saved is new in my soul again because God is here. And I'm living for Him. And I'm obeying the command to go and make disciples and to witness. Maybe God saved that man. I, I, part of me assumes that He did because of the joy I got. I don't know about that. But you all can experience joy like that. You can experience rewards one day in heaven like this passage speaks about. And what we have to do is obey this book. Now every church you're going to go to says, oh, we go by the Bible. That's, But we know every church doesn't. And we know I or no one's perfect either. But if we want real joy in our life, It comes by obedience to God's commands. By going to people, seeking their salvation. And then when we hear, maybe through the grapevine, or maybe on social media, we see them getting baptized. Our hearts go up to heaven. Because we know that God used us to play a small part in that. This is the the reason the church exists. It's for missions. It's the primary, one of the primary reasons. And we are the church here this morning. Amen.